It's the semi-finals of the World Cup and this is the second classical game between Sergei Kayakin and Vladimir Fereseyev. First game drawn and we have a Spanish on the board and it's a classical main line. Closed variation with d6, no marshal anticipated here and h3 preventing that bishop coming out to g4. So the bishop comes here. This is the so-called Zaitsev variation, very, very popular in the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, there were some tremendous struggles between Kasparov and Karpov in this line. So it's, it's very uh, theoretically well-worn. And this is an important moment. Most popular moves here, a4, d5, bishop c2. A3 I like very much. It's, it's a kind of waiting move, waiting to see how black commits, but it's very useful as well. I've played this myself. I really like it. H6, so that prevents any problems with knight g5. Bishop c2. Now, here we can see one of the ideas. Um, the position now explodes with d5. Of course, we'll look at the game continuation in a moment. Let me just show you one of my own games. It went like this, knight b8. So this is very much in the style of the Brea variation, the knight coming here, quite harmonious placement for the knights, and the bishop attacks this, and then you can advance the c-pawn. But here's one of the ideas. b4, knight d7, bishop here, g6, queen b1. Why is white lining up like this? It's about protecting this pawn, and then that frees the knight to come to b3, and that knight is beautifully placed on a5. And then d5 to try and control this square. I really like this system for white. Maybe I'll, I'll show you that game another time. Anyway, that did not happen. Fedosev very quickly went for d5. He'd obviously prepared this very well. The position now explodes. Well, you can see these pawns in the middle of the board. So much tension here. Um, well, Karyakin took on e5. He actually didn't spend very long. The funny thing is, he said afterwards, I knew this move well. When I was 11, I played this line with black against Gatakamsky on the ICC. And he played, well, he played this. Exactly the same as the game. And now here, Karyakin played knight f3. And as Karyakin explained after the game, Kamsky played f4. Now, in an ideal world, this is the move that you want to make. You want to push the rook back. You want to play e5. This kind of pawn structure, very common from, for example, the, the open Spanish. Now, let, let's just put that on the board. I mean, actually, even this position isn't clear, but, you know, you want to push the knight back. You've got these beautiful pawns carving out territory on the king side. The knight comes over. I mean, this is a wonderful attacking position for white. However, there is a problem with f4. You can see just for the moment, black, white's pieces are very gummed up here and the king is exposed. And this is the trap that Karyakin himself actually sprung on Kamsky. Looks like white is safe, but now this tricky move, bishop c8, and Karyakin explained that he actually managed to catch Kamsky out here. Um, let me show you the basic idea. Very clever move, bishop c8, because now if pawn takes rook, you give a check, takes, and queen h4 is mate. Absolutely brutal. So you've got to be very careful here, but like I said, Karyakin, he knew this when he was 11 years old. He played it when he was 11 years old. So he knew that knight f3 is a far more prudent move. Yes, you want to get the f-pawn going, but at the moment, better to keep the king safe. So that knocks the rook back. e5, knight e4. So it very much looks like an open Spanish. You can see the contours of the pawn structure here. This four against three on the king's side and obviously black has the majority of pawns on the queen side which gives some central control and supports that knight on e4. So very double-edged struggle and 
when you have this majority on the king side, this can potentially give you attacking chances against black's king. But first of all, you've got to get rid of that knight on e4. It's very difficult to get things going when that fantastic bishop is blocked on c2. So the struggle revolves a lot around whether white can get rid of that knight or somehow play round it. Very tricky position. Bishop f4. But both players playing relatively quickly. This is the first moment where Karyakin really had a good think. He thought for seven and a half minutes over a4. This mysterious move that is often played in the Spanish. So what's the idea? Well, sometimes you might be able to exchange here and an exchange on a8 might distract black's pieces. That's one thing. If the rook moves away, you might be able to use the open file. You might be able to weaken that pawn so there's some kind of hit with queen d3 or queen e2. It just keeps black on his toes, basically, after a4. So let's see. Um, several moves have been played here before. b4, f6, f5 from Fedoseev, who was still playing relatively quickly. So supporting that knight on e4, which is very hard to budge now. There are pros and cons with that move. Obviously, that knight is very well supported, but it does open up the king. Now, I mentioned earlier about this f-pawn moving, which would have exposed the king. This one does exactly the same. You leave that on f7, the king is far better protected. But it's hard to see how white is breaking through. Here... Karyakin thought for almost 24 minutes. Wow, that is a big investment. But he came up with a very fine idea. He played h4. That's actually a new move in this position. Knight d2 has been played before. h4. Now, one thing is, if you play this move, you have to be absolutely certain that g5 isn't a good move. I mean, if, if the bishop has to drop back, then black is justified in doing this but in fact after this you can take on g5 and then take on f5 these bishops look wonderful the queen is coming to g4 and actually black doesn't have a good defense here it's really interesting how quickly black's king position gets ripped apart here so black has to be very careful and that's the kind of variation that karyakin would have been analyzing so it's a very strategic position. There's play on both sides of the board and in the middle. But you have to justify your strategy with tactics, basically. Bishop b7. Right. Pressure here. And, you know, still maybe gunning for g5. So h5. So that starts to control this square. Start to cramp black's king as well. Very nice move. Is... Is that pawn going to be weak, though? Let's find out. Rook f8 played. Slightly mysterious move. Um, maybe he he's, might feel the need to move that knight at some moment and wants to protect that pawn. But not absolutely necessary. Karyakin exchanges on b5 and takes on a8. So that pawn is unprotected you never know it might uh, be loose there might be some tactic at some moment like this you never know here is a really key move in the game what is white doing what's white doing about this knight well not a lot at the moment but e6 kayakin is bypassing that knight he's Clearing the e5 square for one of these pieces. The knight would love to leap in to get to g6. But this is an incredibly risky move. And, you know, over the last few moves, well, before Karyakin exchanged on b5, in fact, that's when he invested some time. It's such a double-edged move. Of course, when you play e6, the pawn can be vulnerable. You know, you have to watch out for this kind of move or rook f6 or, you know, there are ways that black can attack that pawn. Is it safe? 
Well, let's have a look at queen b6. I should say rook e8 was played here. Let's have a look at queen b6. What happens after this? This is very important to calculate. Knight e5. Queen takes. And now knight g6 is terribly strong. So this you can see how useful this is. The rook moves. And then f3. And the knight, of course, is lost. Pin and win. So e6, rook e8 played. 25 minute think from Fedoseyev with rook e8. So at, it's at that mo moment, clearly, he recognized that things were getting a little tricky. Knight e5. Bishop g5, another big think from Fedoseyev. Knight g6. More tactics here. So again, Karyakin had to calculate this incredibly carefully. What happens on rook takes e6? Well, you can take here. And once again, this pin is incredibly annoying. Or h takes, once again, the pin. Or, let me see, knight takes. This is interesting. Of course, now the knight escapes. But it's remarkable how strong white's attack is in this position. The king surrounded by white's pieces. And actually, you know, this bishop on a8, way out of the game. And it's, it's very difficult for black to free himself here. So, for example, d4. I know I'm going very deeply into this, but I find this variation very, very interesting. And now, actually, black has hardly any moves at all. You can push that pawn. Okay, let's tuck the king out of the way. That's a very Kasparovian move in the Spanish. Bishop c2. And that bishop just wants to come to b3 and strike down this diagonal. That, that Spanish bishop, so often the scourge of black's king in this opening. And, well, if that's queen, then takes. That's why the king came to h2. Now you've got time to come down here and that's going to be total destruction very soon um, and I just want to show you another tactic I know I'm going way too deeply but I'm kind of enjoying this position Bishop d5 does that hold no we've got a lovely knight fork here tremendous stuff so I think it's just a little illustration of how difficult it can be for black's king in these lines and it's all set up with this fantastic idea h5 of fixing that weakness on g6. Right, let's go back to reality. Let's go back to the game continuation. Knight g6 has just been played. Um, that was rook takes e6 we were looking at, but I really, I think those variations, I find them very instructive, um, very typical of these kind of Spanish positions, actually, where it suddenly goes wrong for black. And that's the kind of thing that uh, Karyakin would have been calculating. d4 played. An exchange. And once again, if pawn takes pawn, then f3 would get rid of the knight. This is not the game. But let me just show you this here. e7. Bishop takes. And again, white breaks through. I mean, black hasn't lost anything yet. But that knight is about to be pushed away. And then there could be checks here. There could be a check on e6. Basically, black's king is in massive trouble again. So Karyakin has just exchanged here. So Fedoseyev wants to, to get this bishop going. Tactics, knight takes pawn. But this, in fact, is desperate. After this, queen check. Now, g3 just allows queen h2. No way do you want to do that. Karyakin had seen this all. King g1, queen takes, and now just d5, shutting out that bishop with two passes in the middle of the board. I mean, this is, well, obviously um, fantastic for white. Um, there really is no stopping those. Um, if the queen comes back, whoops, if the queen comes back to blockade, then this can be taken. The king's in trouble. There's bishop g6 stuff. I mean, this is just tremendous. Queen g3 is the last roll of the dice, of course. Well, he's not going to play d6 and allow checkmate, supported by the bishop. But a very cool move here. Not too difficult. Played after a minute and a half. Rook e2, just protecting that. And now that pawn. 
or and both pawns are going to advance. Queen g5 doesn't help matters. Queen d2, last move of the game. Very cool move. Just making sure that there's extra protection here before pushing. Black has nothing at all. Um, for example, if queen g3, then we can push and double protection on this pawn. Um, one of these is going through. Or if queen takes, rook takes, king comes across, d6, nothing to do, for example, here, and one of them rolls home. So that was the final position, queen d2. I think beautifully played by Karyakin. He was really in his element there. Uh, he obviously understands this position so well. And uh, as I mentioned, he'd actually played this position himself when he was 11 years old. So his memory bank's pretty good. He understands these positions incredibly well and went for knight f3. It looks to me like Fedosev, you know, tried something a little bit risky with d5 here, but he got unlucky. Karyakin was very well versed in this. Maybe, maybe Fedosev didn't realize that, um, and I'm afraid his little opening surprise detonated in his face. There we go. Now that means Karyakin is through to the final of the World Cup and also means he has qualified for the candidates. So we now have two players are certain to play in the candidates 2022. We have Karyakin and Rajabov, who's been given a place after, well, the fiasco of 2020. So Rajabov and Karyakin already qualified for the candidates. Very worthy um, participants for the candidates 2022. However, I do hope that we get some representatives from the younger, dynamic generation who also managed to get through. So I'm f crossing my fingers for Duda. He plays a tiebreak against Carlson today in the other semi-final. Don't forget, like, comment, share and subscribe. And do consider supporting us via Patreon or PayPal. Check out my uh, video on the channel homepage where I explain the rewards for, video, for uh, Patreon newsletter, extra videos, that kind of thing. It really does help us if you support the channel. Thanks for watching.